Good morning and welcome to worship at Emmanuel United Church here in Brampton. We are so very glad that you're able to join us on this morning of Pentecost. Easter has, has run its course. We are at the end of the transition season when Jesus has finally ascended into heaven and now the Spirit has come to be among us and to work with us and to bless us with its presence. I am the Reverend Tom McNeil and together with musical leadership from the New Directions Choir, I will be leading you in worship for the next hour. Our opening hymn today is going to be from Voices United, number 385, Spirit Divine, Attend Our Prayers. together as one. We are drawn together by the Spirit, for we are all God's children. Let us worship God. And as we gather, we remember that there was once someone told such amazing stories and did such astounding things, the people followed him, and they asked him, who are you? And one day Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And 
Let us join our voices together in the prayer of approach, saying, Holy Spirit, who is the beginning and swept over the face of creation, who animates all things, who moves our hearts, bless us today on this day of your arrival among the followers of Jesus, that we may again feel and be animated and uplifted by your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised your arrival to continue his work. Amen. And now I would invite anyone who's perhaps been born within the past few years, or maybe you're just feeling very young and spry this morning. Whatever the reason, if you feel young at heart, come on forward. And let's share a story together from the second chapter of Acts. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force, no one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then, when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were blown away. They couldn't, for the life of them, figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthens, Medes, and Elamites. Visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs, they're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talk back and forth, confused. What is going on here? Others joke. <laughs> They're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. This is the witness of the church. Thanks be to God. So, in our story there, we heard about the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is kind of an odd thing. I mean, we, we can't really see it. We can't say, look, there's the Spirit. Oh, there's the Spirit over there. But you know what? The Holy Spirit, well, we heard it arrive like a rush of wind. 
And you can't really see the wind, can you? But you can sure see what the wind is doing as it makes all those streamers go. And that's how it is with the spirit. You can't actually see the spirit. But you can sure tell when it's doing something. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, who in the beginning moved on the waters of creation, who breathed life into all of us, we give thanks that you came to us after Jesus left us. You came to guide us. You came to comfort us. You came to keep us going. And in these days of uncertainty as we wait for things to go back to normal, whatever that might end up looking like. Spirit, we ask that we might know of your presence by the things that you do. That even though we can't see you directly, we can certainly see you at work in the world. At work in us and in others. And whenever we do see that, we ask that we would be open that we would be able to help. We ask that if we don't know how to help, we can ask other people, and that there would be good mentors and teachers and ministers in our lives so that we can learn more about what you would have us do and so that we can follow you as those early disciples followed you. Amen. And our Young at Heart hymn, is More Voices, number 23, Come, Holy Spirit.
because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you all into the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
us gather our hearts in prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be an acceptable offering to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it's the day of Pentecost. 50 days after Easter. Now, if you actually count off the days in the calendar, you'll notice the actual day of Pentecost was Thursday, I think. Um, we're, we're extending it a little bit because we know everyone comes out on a Sunday, and that's when we're going to celebrate it because that's when everyone gets together. And it is a celebration. It's, it's perhaps the biggest celebration that we've got because this is where Jesus really shines through. This is where his ministry and his work really shines through. The, the Holy Spirit comes to his followers on wind, with fire. We've already heard the Holy Spirit likened to a dove. When the Spirit comes down on Jesus during the baptism. Now, if you're anything like me, you might notice that we, we say an awful lot about God the Father. And uh, we have a few books to Jesus. But that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, we don't really say a whole lot about the Spirit here in the West. Now, in Eastern Orthodoxy, they do say an awful lot more about the Holy Spirit. But over, over here in the West, we may rightly say, who is the Spirit? What's, what's the purpose of the Spirit? What does the Spirit actually do in our lives? Well, our, our first introduction to the Spirit and the work of the Spirit comes in the farewell discourse in John. And this is the teaching that Jesus offers during the Last Supper. And as he's teaching, I'm sure, all of his disciples who were sitting there were absolutely dumbfounded. Jesus is talking about being betrayed. Jesus is talking about going away. Now, Jesus has, has talked about things like this before. We, we heard about it when, or we will hear about it next week, when Jesus and Nicodemus meet. We've heard about it elsewhere. The, the crowd at the temple heard about the Spirit and heard that Jesus was going to be going away. Um, the, the disciples heard about the Spirit and about Jesus going away. But right now, they're focused on Jesus leaving. They're focused on Jesus going away. They're absolutely dumbfounded. And it's, it's horrible timing that Jesus is coming out with this, because they're supposed to be celebrating the Passover meal, which is, in the Jewish calendar, one of the most joyful events. It was their liberation from Egypt. It was the final plague that finally convinced the Pharaoh to let God's people go. And, and Israelites, through the centuries, even in exile, had celebrated this holy day, had marked it, had remembered it. When the disciples arrived at Jesus' triumphal entry earlier that week, they thought, this is it. This is when it's going to happen. The kingdom will be restored. This is awesome. And now Jesus is kind of going the other way around. Talk about being a drag. He's just dragging everything down. And it kind of makes for a bit of an awkward party. They're supposed to be happy, but they're getting all of this heavy news, all of this heavy teaching. Jesus even says, look, I've got a lot more to tell you guys, but I know you can't bear it right now. They are absolutely dumbfounded, heartbroken. And it might be something that's difficult for us to relate to, but 
we've also been going through a season without something. And I think if anyone had known about a year ago, a year and a few months ago, that the pandemic would last this long, I mean, we knew we were in it for the long haul, but we didn't think that we would still be apart over a year later. We, we've lost something. We've lost this weekly gathering that many of us <laughs> anticipated. Many of us looked forward to being able to gather, to sing together, or, or at least listen to some people sing, to shake hands, to catch up on the goings-on, to share some coffee, maybe even go out for lunch afterwards. And so much has been taken away. And this is a problem for us. This is a, a sociological problem, first off, because we, we are social creatures. Human beings do not do well in isolation. And you know when the introvert is saying that we've had enough isolation, we've had enough isolation. We're wired to be around people. And with this isolation, it's causing us a lot of problems. But even more than that, it's also causing us some theological problems. And I'm not just talking about doctrinal problems in the beginning, like, okay, how are we going to handle communion? How are we going to handle uh, offerings? How, how are we going to be able to, to serve as the hands and feet of Christ in the neighborhood if we're shut down for months and months on end. We are the body of Christ. We are supposed to work together. And how do we do that when we are fractured and broken apart like this? Isolated in our own homes. We can't serve one another. How, how can we show that we love one another? How can we actually love one another? Forget about showing it. Jesus leaves us with the commandment to love one another as I have loved you, and yet here we are. Can we really show that? How do we show that? How do we do that? And, and for many of us, there's probably also a, a bit of a future-looking problem of, of what the church is going to look like when we get back together. We know it's going to be in phases. We're not just going to throw open the doors and everyone's going to come back like nothing happened. We're going to come back together slowly. What's that going to look like? What's it going to look like when this is finally over, whatever that means? Are we going to be able to sing together? Is there ever going to be a, a reduction of masks? Are we, are we going to be able to shake? Are we going to be able to hug for those of us who hug? There are all these questions about how are we going to interact? What is church going to be like? And if we had known a year and a bit ago all that we would be facing now, I don't think we could have bared it. I know it would have been difficult for me to realize that all of this is going to happen. It's a trying time, and just as the apostles lost Jesus, we might well feel that we've lost something. And yet, Jesus did not leave his disciples without help. Jesus makes the promise that someone will come. Now, in the NRSV, this someone is referred to as the advocate. In other translations, a helper or a companion. The original Greek word is paraclete. And I'm going to use that word in referring to this person who is coming largely because the English translations don't quite get everything. A paraclete was a court term. A paraclete was an agent in a courtroom. And they kind of served a bit as an attorney. They, they were prosecuting the case, but they were also defending. And in the world, the paraclete would prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The 
The prevailing thought at the time was God had issued a strict set of commands. Follow those commands, and you're free of sin. Jesus came to say, well, those commands are more teachings, and really everything is summed up in love. And that love is relational. It creates relationships. And if you believe me, if you believe in that love, and you enter into a relationship with God, then you're without sin. It doesn't mean you're not going to do bad things, but it does mean that in that relationship with God, you can always atone for what has happened. And the longer you're in that relationship, the less you're going to need to. Because God will make you more holy the longer you're in that relationship. The paraclete would prove the world wrong about righteousness. You see, with Jesus being crucified, that would seem to be it. It would seem, and most people thought, well, clearly God isn't with Jesus if that happened. But, surprise, Jesus' death wasn't defeat. It was actually his victory when he proved that it was possible to live a life without sin. Sin wasn't a necessary part of our lives. We could work to be rid of it. That death wasn't the final say. That Jesus was returning to God and he would be proven right. And finally about judgment. The paraclete would prove the world wrong about judgment. Because they thought that the judgment from the ruler of the world meant the end of Jesus. But the ruler of the world was wrong. And I'm not talking about Pontius Pilate or the Sanhedrin or the emperor in Rome. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about that deep urge to go it alone. That we can have a deep, meaningful, purposeful life on our own, without help from anywhere, and certainly not God. The paraclete would prove that wrong, would prove that idea wrong, that the only way to have a meaningful, purposeful life, fulfilling life, was a life in service to God and to others. And this is what the paraclete would draw the apostles into. The paraclete also had a, a comforting role in the church. The paraclete was going to continue Jesus' mission of revealing where God was in the world, of what God was doing. And those who followed the paraclete would know where God was and what God was doing in the world. They would have that insight. And more importantly, the paraclete would enable the disciples to proclaim Jesus, to share that good news with everyone that they met. And that not only would these disciples who were in the room be able to do that, but the disciples who followed them, and the disciples who followed them, and followed them, and so on until it reached us. And through the Spirit, we are able to do that as well, to know where Jesus and God are in the world, to know what they're doing, to share that with others, to, to help as we're able to participate in that holy plan of redemption. That God is not some far-off entity that makes divine decrees from some ethereal plane. God is right here among us, laughing with us, weeping with us, growing with us, suffering with us. God came to us as one of us, and God is still with us. These books are not some commentary on some wandering preacher from thousands of years ago. What he said then is true and useful and valuable now. Perhaps now more so than ever. And it is the Spirit that enables us to continue in this mission. 
We sing in the song of faith that we sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable, who is creatively and redemptively active in the world. Through the paraclete, Jesus' mission continues. The paraclete helps to create the church, this gathering of Christ followers, dedicating their lives to Christ, following Christ, serving Christ, and sharing this wonderful news that Christ brings us. This church proclaims Jesus in word and in deed, in what we do. And perhaps the greatest act that we can do that sustains us, that enables us to do that mission of proclamation is prayer. It's letting go and letting the Spirit enter into us. The Spirit is coming to us all the time. The Spirit comes to us in the sacrament of baptism when we welcome new members into the faith. The Spirit comes to us in the sacrament of communion when we gather and are nourished by the blood of Christ, that life force of Christ that sustains us. And the Spirit is with us whenever the Word is proclaimed. It isn't some ancient book. It is very relevant and very real and very useful now if we let the Spirit speak through it. If we just read it as a collection of words on the page, we end up being legalists. It ends up being devoid of meaning, devoid of worth. But with the Spirit lighting it on fire, it transforms the Word into something that can transform us and help us to lead fulfilling lives. And the Spirit is ready to lead us if we just open ourselves up in prayer. And prayer isn't just a list of petitions. God, I wish you would do this. God, please help with this. However altruistic these petitions may be, prayer is something more. Prayer is that holy conversation with God. It doesn't have to be long, but it does have to be sincere. It does have to be from the heart, as we open our hearts to the very heart of God. And allowing that heart to guide our hearts. Letting go and letting the Spirit take over. And the Spirit leads us when we share the good news. The Spirit puts us in the right place at the right time to share that good news with the right person who's ready to hear the right word of encouragement, of invitation, of guidance. The Spirit leads us in worship, comforting us and transforming us simultaneously, renewing us in the fire of the Spirit so that we can go out to do what we are called to do. The Spirit leads us when we fellowship, when we build vibrant and authentic community, not just country clubs where everyone dresses up, puts on an act, and then goes back to their old life, but where we really come together, where we really support one another, where we offer up what is truly in our hearts to one another and receive what is in others' hearts. And we lift that up in prayer. The Spirit leads us in discipleship, molding us into the likeness of Christ, changing us little by little, until eventually the person who we were a few years ago is a stranger to us, because the Spirit has so entered into our lives and so changed us. And the Spirit leads us when we go out into the world to serve others by igniting that passion within us to say, I see this problem and it must be no more. And all of this, the sharing the good news, the worship, the fellowship, the discipleship, the service, all of it starts with prayer starts with opening ourselves up so that we can let God guide us. 
guiding us to the right people, guiding us to the right situations, guiding us towards God, guiding us away from times of trouble, away from times that cause our hearts to tremble. The disciples' hearts were trembling when they heard that Jesus was going away. They thought that was the end, and they didn't know what was coming next. And we are sometimes worried ourselves about what the future might hold for the church. We don't know what the next step will look like. But the Spirit came 2,000 years ago to take these troubled men and women, to guide them, towards doing great things, towards a great legacy that stretched on for centuries after them, that would help other people. And that same spirit who helped them is ready to help us. All we need to do is offer ourselves up in prayer. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, comes in the beginning like a soft breeze, gently nudging us, and then builds in intensity until we can't even believe what is before us. Spirit, you guide us in prayer, and for many of us, prayer is something we don't understand, and it's something difficult for us to commit to. You are always there. And whether our prayers last for a few seconds, for a few minutes, or maybe for some of us even a few hours, you are always there ready to hear whatever we offer, to receive whatever we offer, and make great things out of it. And we just ask that in the coming months, until we are able to gather again, and even beyond that, that we would be open to your call, that we would be able to pray and see the signs that you are listening to what it is that we are praying for. And that everything we do might be used to lift up God, to bring people into communion with God, so that the whole world can know what it truly is to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is from Voices United, number 368, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
The offerings that are made to the church sustain our ministries and help us to help the Spirit move in the world. Offerings to our local ministries and to our mission and service fund can be sent to Emmanuel United Church at the address on your screen, or they can be dropped off at the mail slot just off the parking lot. Alternatively, you can always make your donations electronically. Just go to our website, and there's a few links on the front page that will take you to our donations page. But however the offerings are received today, we give thanks. Redemption and salvation is never-ending. We give thanks that we can all participate in that mission through our offerings of time, money, and prayer. Bless what we give here. Our time to write a letter of amnesty or offer a word of encouragement. Our check who are on the street or spare change for someone who needs a coffee. Our prayers for your kingdom or the concerns of your children. May all of our efforts be put to use in your vineyard so that all may be invited to the feast. We ask in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us offer up prayers of the people. We give thanks for the mysterious ways you move in the world, God. For the winds of comfort, for the changing of the seasons, for spreading seeds of outreach into the world through the many ministries that partner with our Mission and Service Fund. of a reopening for at least part of the summer that we can gather and that we can safely enjoy the good weather. We give thanks for the fact that the vulnerable in our community haven't been forgotten, that organizations and churches have stepped up to fill the gaps. mysterious ways you move in the church. And especially this week, we give thanks for the ways you move in Bradford United Church, in Wesley United Church in Stouffville, and in North Bramalee United Church in Brampton. And we give thanks for the way that you breathe new life into hymns, into liturgies, into ministries, that they might serve you anew.
especially we give thanks for the mysterious ways that you move in each one of us, for the sustaining hope and peace that we can experience in our lives, for the ways that you challenge us to love new people in new ways. thankful that we may offer these and all our prayers to you, as to our mother who loves us, as to And if you have announcements, you can send them to office at emmanuelunited.com. I know some people have other ways of getting a hold of me, and if you send me requests other ways, they might get in. If you send requests this way, I guarantee they'll get in. So those are the, the official ways to get prayers and announcements put into the life and work at Emmanuel United. We do offer up prayers of concern this week for Warren Simpson and for Dion Hastings. Uh, we do have a prayer of celebration, a couple of them. Uh, Bob McMurchy, who some of you may recall last week was in hospital with an infection. We have word that he is returning home today. So we are very thankful that uh, our prayers have been answered in this case. And of course, today is Al Fisher's birthday. Now, I don't know what number it is, so I'm not going to ask, but happy birthday, Al. Uh, we have a few events uh, of course, tomorrow being Victoria Day, I know it's weird that there is going to be a day off, uh, but with that day off, the exercise class is going to get bumped forward onto Tuesday. Uh, this Friday, there is a game night on Zoom. For information, email our office. Bingo cards will be emailed out. Uh, so we hope to see you there. Uh, there's more than bingo going on, but bingo is always a big hit, I think. Uh, we also have... 
The ponytail challenge. Uh, put a ponytail on the back of your head. Many of us can actually do that now to some degree. So put a ponytail on, take a picture of the back of your head, send it to the office. And we're going to see whose back of head is most recognizable. And given as not many people have seen the back of my head, I'm curious if anyone will get mine. Um, and, and the person who has the most correct matches, uh, Rick's going to give a haircut to, I, I don't know if that's incentive or not. Uh, we also, uh, speaking of Rick and Diane, they have a number of available puzzles. You can call the number on the screen if you would like to get a puzzle. Uh, and I think that is all of the news and events for this week. Am I missing anything? I don't believe that I am. So, as our time comes to a close, we change the light of the Christ candle. That it entered into the world as a rush of flame, and it is carried out into the world on a gust of wind. And wherever you may go this week, may you encounter the light of Christ. And now I would invite you to join your voices together for the benediction. Let us pray. We go out from here as messengers of love. And as the fellow white dove, we go to spread the good news. We go out from here to serve God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. And as a snow white dove, we go to spread the good news. We go out from here to share with others the good news. The Spirit is among us. And as a snow white dove, we go to spread the good news. Amen. And our closing hymn is from More Voices, number 13, O Let the Power Fall on Me.